Hello there everyone, this is Seb and welcome to another one of these archive videos in which I take the audio and video contents of a CDI disc and basically put them into one video for easy access for those who do not have a CDI player and who might be interested in this stuff because emulation is eh, still a bit of a bother unfortunately. Anyway, for today's uh, topic we have a, a bit of an interesting thing. It's, uh, it's a travel brochure because back in the 90s Paper was old fashioned, so everything had to go digital. Uh, so you also had these travel brochures that uh, came about and you had some on PC, but also on CDI. And they basically were kind of an interactive way to explore like a country, a city, you know, kind of just to give you an idea and make you want to go there and, and you know spend money on, on the city. <laughs> they were like big promotional things um, and this one in particular or this series actually was actually produced in Canada which is uh, kind of interesting to me because I don't know of many Canadian produced CDI titles. I think this is a defunct company. I can't find much information about it, but I think it was a company that was uh, kind of a, a travel agency maybe. Uh, it was called uh, On Cue Corporation and apparently they had a, an explorers club which you could sign up for and through that you got promotions and also uh, you could order these discs. The one we are looking at today is uh, comes from their uh, World of Wonders series Destination Great Britain and this one in particular is about uh, central and northern England. Now I have another one of these which uh, we might take a look at another time which is for uh, England West Country. These things were produced in 1994. Uh, the disc also talks about the series for France but I don't think those ever came to be so these things might not have been very popular at all. Um, I'm also not sure where they were distributed exactly, like in Canada obviously, but uh, chances are that they were also distributed in the Americas, uh, or at least in, in North America. So basically this is kind of like a road trip and I try to kind of recreate it where we go through the different sections um, in, in a circle and just explore the different places. Some video content is there, most of it is just voiceover over pictures and also there's uh, like uh, places you could stay. Um, one thing I did not include here is the addresses because a lot of these places are private bed and breakfasts and this stuff is all from the early 90s so I don't know if they are still in business so it didn't feel right to include all those uh, those addresses of those bed and breakfasts but you do get the pictures and uh, you know um, it, it, to me it's just nice to it's kind of like stepping into that time machine and, and just going back to that time and just explore what it was like then. Now we are talking about England so you know chances are not that much has changed I guess uh, but it would be interesting to uh, to hear from people who actually are familiar with these places. Uh, the disc is basically split in two parts one is um, like the topic of the disc and one part is more general which I think is shared throughout all the four discs uh, although I did not um, compare them fully yet um, but I'm pretty sure that if we do take a look at the other disc at some point that I can just skip out the second part altogether with the general information which is just travel tips and such. Um, but yeah, it's just fun to hear like if you have a better Mox uh, camera then uh, do be sure to bring your own cassette tapes and uh, you know that's still accurate because um, yeah it's very hard to find Betamax cassette tapes uh, to uh, put in your recorder nowadays, that's for sure. <laughs> um, what's also hilarious is that uh, the Dutch had nothing to do with it, as far as I know on this, uh, I don't think Philips had anything to do with this production either. However, there is a very clear sponsorship with K uh, KLM, which is the Dutch Royal Air 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 Airlines. And it is hilarious to me because um, I'm, I'm pretty sure even in the 90s, like I know that Amsterdam, uh, Schiphol, it's a main port to Europe, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that even back then, or probably even more back then than now, there were direct intercontinental flights um, from the US and Canada to, well, the old country. 
um, but for some reason this disc keeps on insisting that you actually go through Amsterdam because KLM is the sponsor of this disc there's even an ad for KLM on there there's even two ads on here <laughs> which are all the way on the end of the video if you want to check those out uh, one of which I don't even know what company it is because they never name it and I don't know the the, the logo of that company so if you anyone knows uh, do let me know anyway uh, I will just stop blabbering and I will just just have the disc do the speaking for you uh, I hope you will enjoy it and uh, yeah let me know what you thought and I will see you guys uh, next time until then take care and the muzzle for now Great Britain, rich in history and culture, is blessed with breathtaking landscapes and extraordinary people. Join us as we tour the south of England and London, the West Country, Wales, Scotland, Central England and the North Country. Here we'll travel from the lonely Yorkshire moors to bustling university towns. Select one of the highlighted trips to enter the travel journal and join Jeff and Ed on their personal tours of Central and Northern England. They'll show you where they went, who they met, and what they learned. They'll give you first-hand information about where they stayed along the way, from a charming stone cottage to a gracious Regency hotel. Follow along and plan your own trip. We have included many travel tips with all the information you'll need for a well-planned holiday. Just press the familiar information icon to find tips on booking your flight, renting a car, currency exchange, or electrical standards. You can survey all of Great Britain with your own interests and hobbies in mind. Special interest topics may be browsed from the travel tip section. Just press the familiar information icon. So go ahead, make a selection, and begin your interactive adventure. The wild beauty of Northern England has inspired countless writers. Emily Bronte, the author of Wuthering Heights, grew up in Hayworth. I could almost see Heathcliff striding across the nearby moors. This bucolic village is in James Harriet country. William Wordsworth lived here at Dove Cottage. He composed some of his best poems during long walks through the Lake District. York, the regional metropolis, may not be known for its literary associations, but it has other features, such as the old city walls. This green and pleasant land, this England, owes much of its unique charm to the hand of man. The English countryside has long since learned to bend to his will without detriment to either. Here in the north of England, many generations of farming folk have tied themselves to the soil, easing from nature that which she can provide, taking care to stay in harmony with her so that those who follow continue to benefit from her generous spirit. And yet even here, where man and nature have learned to live at ease with one another, there still remains much that is wild and untamed. This is the real England, an England where proud mountains and rugged moorlands soar defiantly above the gentler slopes of winding valleys. Where surging rivers roar and plunge, where crystal streams tumble and splash over rocky cascades. Wild, romantic places, demanding of the artist's truest line, the writer's finest words. Many have found great inspiration here. The 
broad sweep of moorland overlooking the Yorkshire village of Howarth is where the Bronte sisters found theirs. These are the same cobbled streets that once echo to the footsteps of Charlotte, Emily and Anne. The solid Yorkshire stone buildings they would have looked down upon from the parsonage where they lived. It was here that the classics Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights and the tenant of Wildfell Hall were all written. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills. These immortal lines, from one of the best loved poems in the English language, were penned by William Wordsworth over 180 years ago. His Lakeland home, Dove Cottage at Grasmere, has changed little since then. Its tiny rooms frozen in time, exactly as they were when Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy lived here. And England's North Country continues to provide inspiration even to this day. This unassuming veterinary surgery, Thirsk in Yorkshire, is where the world's most famous vet, James Herriot, practiced his skills. And he was married just down the road, here at St Mary's. From this busy little market town, he would make his daily rounds among the farmlands of his beloved Yorkshire Dales. He also found time to write of his exploits in a series of wonderfully funny books, and the lovely surroundings that inspired them have secured a special place in the hearts of millions. And the same is true of the Northeast, where one of the world's most successful writers, Catherine Cookson, continues to draw the inspiration for her best-selling novels. But then England's North Country is an inspiring place. Rarely more so than here, on the Northumbrian coast, where 12th century castles look stoically out to sea. Some, like Dunstanborough, lonely outposts, their once glorious days of power long since lost in time. Others, like Banborough, still occupy to this day. And perhaps most romantic of all, Lindisfarne, the tiniest of strongholds, out on the farthermost tip of Holy Island. Many an inland skyline, too, is dominated by the once proud ramparts of ancient castles. Here are colourful histories and stirring tales to be told. Skipton Castle is in Yorkshire, but during the War of the Roses, it aligned itself not with York, but with the rival House of Lancaster. And yet, despite the trouble this must have caused, and even though its inhabitants were later obliged to endure three years of siege during the Civil War, it somehow managed to survive intact, and is now one of the most complete and well-preserved of all medieval castles. The north of England nurtures the sad ruins of many ancient abbeys and priories. Haunting places, often beautiful, even in decay. The history of England's north country is endlessly fascinating and the tales of the turbulent days of Viking invasion and the eventual settlement of the barbarian tribes here in England makes absorbing reading. The Isle of Man, a jewel of an island in the middle of the Irish Sea, was once a Viking lair from which fierce Norwegian raiders would make their sorties. Like many parts of England's North Country, the Isle of Man can be breathtakingly beautiful. It's probable that the Vikings cared little for such things, and even the Romans, who occupied much of mainland Britain for four centuries, 
chose to ignore this lovely island. Such is their loss, but they certainly left their mark elsewhere. The Romans' greatest monument in Britain remains the wall the Emperor Hadrian built in AD 122 to mark the northern boundary of his empire. Large sections of the wall still stand, and its course can be traced for 70 miles. It's a romantic and fascinating route, traversing some of the wildest country in Britain, a pathway that many choose to explore and follow. Like the Romans in their day, the British too once ruled an empire. In those days, ships of the British flag sailed the seven seas, and Liverpool on the west coast, the port from which many would have sailed, was a thriving center of commerce. These colorful times, times when thousands were sailing from England to settle in America, Australia, and New Zealand, are captured here in the Merseyside Maritime Museum, itself a part of Liverpool's newly developed Albert Dock complex. But the North Country's strongest connections with America and Australasia are to be found here on the northeast coast of England. The Yorkshire port of Whitby is where Captain James Cook, the last of the great explorers, began his seafaring career. And it was he who in 1770 claimed Australia and New Zealand for the British crown. I recognized Castle Howard immediately from the television series Brideshead Revisited. This mansion was designed in the 18th century by Sir John Vanbrugh, a soldier and playwright who dabbled in architecture for pleasure. The Red House in Warham Le Street is about 23 miles from York. This gracious Victorian home is a pleasant retreat in the Yorkshire Wolds, with a 12th century Saxon church in the backyard. This tree obviously has a strong will to live. Harrogate was a busy spa resort town in the 19th century. Up to 60,000 visitors came to take the waters each year. I traveled through Yorkshire in style on the Kildwick, Cayley and Wath Railway. In Skipton, I saw the Flagcrackers perform Border Morris music and dance. Their blackened faces ensure anonymity. Another afternoon of fence hopping. Yorkshire isn't an official county name anymore. Yet this term still evokes visions of pastoral dales interspersed with rich pasture and moorlands. I immediately recognized this idyllic scenery from the James Harriet TV series, especially the tangle of dry stone walls and field barns. This village was featured in the opening sequence of All Creatures Great and Small. I journeyed south through a long river valley known as Wharfdale. Dry stone walls are so vital to New Yorkshire scenery that farmers can receive government grants to repair them. This 200-year-old field barn was used to house cattle and hay over the winter. There's a great view of the marketplace from Richmond Castle. The Bull Hotel is a family-run establishment in the market town of Sedberg. There's a comfortable residence lounge and a bar serving Whitbread's traditional beers. The restaurant specializes in grills and other English classics. The topiary gardens at Levens Hall inspired me to do something with the bushes in my own backyard. These horticultural designs date from 1690. As I traveled to the Lake District, I kept my eyes peeled for fell races. These are running competitions across the hills. I learned more than I ever wanted to know about sheep and wool at Town End, a restored 16th century yeoman farmer's cottage. Rosemount is a family-run hotel just moments from Lake Windermere in the heart of the Lake District. Take note, this establishment caters exclusively to non-smokers. Don't forget to relax in the lounge with some Wordsworth poetry. An obvious tourist attraction, but I simply couldn't resist this 17th century bridge house. A family of eight once lived in its two tiny rooms. This short-haired, tailless cat originated on the Isle of Man. The Manx, or residents of the Isle of Man, have always been rather independent. Easdale Guesthouse is located in the charming village of Ambleside. It is walking distance from tennis courts and a Roman fort. Start off your day right with either Continental, Full Cumbrian, Weight Watchers, or Vegetarian breakfast. 
millions of international visitors come to walk the ancient hills, or fells as they are known locally. I joined some friends for what I thought was a hike. It turned out to be a pleasant stroll. There were even steps for crossing the ubiquitous stone walls. William Wordsworth adored the Lake District. One friend calculated that in his lifetime, the poet walked 180,000 miles throughout the Lake District. Wordsworth composed many poems as he roamed over hill and vale. Embrace me then, ye hills, and close me in. Now, in the clear and open day, I feel your guardianship. The Castle Rig Stone Circle is as old as Stonehenge. No one's really sure why it has a commanding view of surrounding hilltops, or what type of rituals were performed here. It might have been a mystical site, or even an early form of parliament. Lake Windermere is a popular holiday resort. By the way, mere is the old Scottish word for sea. At ten and a half miles long, Windermere is England's largest lake, yet it's only about a mile wide. All of the lakes in this region are long fingers scooped out by glaciers. Dove Cottage, William Wordsworth's home for almost nine years, is in the village of Grasmere. Wordsworth moved to this former inn with Dorothy, his sister and constant companion. A few years later, he married, and his wife joined their home of plain living and high thinking. The Wordsworths frequently entertained fellow writers, including Sir Walter Scott, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Thomas de Quincey. Once, more than 20 guests stayed the night in this tiny cottage come literary salon. Keswick, a premier resort town in the famed English Lake District, is an old wool market town. Greystones is a family-run hotel on the outskirts of Keswick. Eileen prepares imaginative dishes with local produce. After dinner, you can plan hiking trips in their comfortable lounge. The Beaches is a Georgian residence near Carlisle. The bedrooms are beautifully furnished in country style. Broomhouse Farm is ideally situated for visiting Hadrian's Wall and historic Hexham. This bed and breakfast is on a working farm near Haltwhistle. Guests are invited to relax in the comfortable sitting room and admire the unspoiled Northumbrian countryside. The bedrooms have a distinctly homey touch. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Roman Emperor Hadrian established this wall to separate a conquered, peaceful, and prosperous Britain from the barbarians in the region now known as Scotland. The 73-mile wall was designed to take advantage of strategic hills and slopes. This lonely, damp posting must have been a rude surprise for many Roman soldiers. Corstopatum, now known as Corbridge, was an important garrison town and supply base for soldiers defending the frontier. Vallum Lodge Hotel is only a hop, skip, and a jump from Hadrian's Wall. The simple dining room features classic English dishes and vegetarian meals. All the comfortable bedrooms are on the ground floor. Gorgeous views are guaranteed. How would you like to stay at a real castle? Langley Castle Hotel is set in 10 acres of Northumbrian woods. It's a perfect balance of medieval romance and modern amenities. I found the spiral staircase intriguing. Relax in the drawing room after a long walk around the grounds or stop in the bar for a drink. The Anchor is a quaint riverside guesthouse. Midway between Newcastle and Carlisle, it was an important coaching inn for centuries. Their comprehensive menu includes vegetarian dishes. Ale, spirits, and liqueurs are available in the residence lounge. The fully furnished bedrooms are the epitome of coziness. Several cohorts of Roman soldiers lodged at Vindolanda, just south of the wall. The museum on the premises has a collection of rare Roman documents and daily objects. Middlemarch is a well-preserved Georgian home. There are four spacious bedrooms, including a four-poster ensuite room. 
The Riverside is a pleasant 18th century home located in a charming Northumbrian village. The stylish bedrooms are quite spacious. It would be hard to miss the Bay Horse Inn. This gaily decorated 18th century coaching inn is just off the A68 tourist route. The inn features a fully stocked bar and snug lounge decorated with equestrian paraphernalia. The dining room offers superb a la carte cuisine. High Yarrow Farm is a stone house at the head of the Kielder Reservoir. You can always be assured of a warm welcome at this working farm in Northumberland National Park. Burnus Hotel is an 18th century country house on the edge of the Reedsdale Forest, next to the Scottish border. Drop in for a pint after walking or angling, then feast on local dishes and rest your weary head in one of their comfortable bedrooms. Today I awoke early to savor the Northumbrian dawn. Forlorn and windswept, the moors have a melancholic appeal. I ventured along the tail end of the Pennine Way, a classic 270-mile British ramble. The Pennine Way starts near Manchester and follows the Pennine Mountains, England's backbone, all the way to the Scottish border. It's a popular hiking path, but even so, there was no one except for the ever-present sheep, my faithful companions on this lonely walk. I recognized this imposing castle immediately as the setting for Roman Polanski's film version of Macbeth. This castle was built to protect the harbor on Holy Island the cradle of early Christianity. Northern England was once entirely forested. Now tranquil woods like this are few and far between. Don't bypass Newcastle upon Tyne. This former industrial center has been revitalized, and the locals, called Geordies, are among the most friendly people I met in England. Durham Cathedral is a great example of imposing, no-nonsense, Norman architecture. Whitby is a former whaling port and shipbuilding town at the mouth of the River Esk. The explorer Captain Cook served his seafaring apprenticeship here in the 18th century. High up on a cliff, a 13th century abbey presides over Whitby. Locals told me this fishing village was a refuge for its socialist robber namesake. I'm skeptical about that legend, but I have no doubt that it was an important landing site for smugglers. Sutton Bank offers a panoramic view of the vast York Plain. The veterinarian writer James Harriet claims this to be the finest view in all of England. The gently rolling moors stretch into the distance like a plush carpet. I poked about in the lonesome valleys of the North York Moors National Park, where I discovered bizarre rock formations called Bridestones and the remains of a Roman road near Wheeldale. From the beach to the castle, Scarborough is a great holiday resort. Riveau Abbey, the first large-scale Cistercian monastery in England, is a testament to the monks' success at sheep farming. This white horse was carved in the 19th century by schoolmaster and his pupils. It's more than 300 feet long. There's nothing halfway about this B&B &B near Easingwold. Hostess Belle Hepworth bends over backwards to accommodate her guests. She even lends out tennis shoes and her dog. This restored Victorian home has wonderful views of the Dales. I approached York Minster from Stonegate, the old Roman high street. Actually, I'd been peeking at the Minster from several vantage points during the day. It's hard not to. In the seventh century, Anglo-Saxon King Edwin of Northumbria built a wooden church in York for his own baptism. Its successor, the medieval minster, is the largest Gothic church in England. In the Middle Ages, York was the second most important city in England. I took a guided tour of the old city walls. 
Apparently, this old gate narrowly escaped destruction by Victorian city planners. Medieval houses on the shambles are so close together, you can almost shake hands between the top windows. Derived from the word flesh amels, or butcher's street, the shambles was once dripping with the thick, sweet scent of blood. At one time, St. Mary's was the most important Benedictine abbey in northern England. Every four years, mystery plays, reenactments of biblical stories, are performed among the abbey ruins. Romans, Anglo-Saxons, Vikings, and a host of other invaders established garrisons at York, a strategic river junction. For centuries, it was a major port and trading center. Now, fishermen and pleasure boaters congregate on the river. My kids adored the Jorvik Viking Center in York. This is Coppergate Street in the year 948. The recreated Victorian street in the York Castle Museum is so convincing that I nearly clamored into the handsome cab. The Viking connection in York is apparent in many street names. Gate is a Scandinavian word for street. St. Mary's Hotel is located right in York, making it a convenient stop. The illustrious University of Cambridge colleges are set in pastoral grounds. There is much more to university than studying. I also visited the Fens, a flat landscape of primeval marsh and rich farmland. Windmills dot the countryside, just like in Holland. Most foreign tourists don't venture here because it isn't on the way to any major tourist area. Some locals were genuinely surprised to see me. Yet the English have always flocked to the seaside resorts on this Norfolk coast. Coastal Suffolk is a calm and picturesque area of gentle farmland surrounding quaint villages and seaside towns, each with its own individual flavour. The tang of sea spray in the air invites a stroll at the water's edge along wide open beaches. but it's also an area of constant change. The coastline is gradually tipping into the sea. The countryside is changing too, as new farming methods take hold. There's a little area known as the Garden of Suffolk in the valley of the River Minsmere, alongside an old Roman road. The villages of Yoxford, Peasenhall and Sibton reveal the changing architecture of Suffolk with a pleasant jumble of buildings which span centuries of taste and style. Religion, too, has done much to change Suffolk. Monastic foundations once owned much of the land and employed most of the people. Many fascinating remnants still stand to remind us of the Reformation, like this vast abbey near Leyston. And this, too, has changed. An octagonal gate turret was added in Tudor times. A more recent restoration by the Pro Quarter Trust has created a superb concert hall in the ancient barn. Music has also brought change to the area. Benjamin Britten was strongly influenced by Aldborough and its surroundings, and it was here that he founded the world-famous Aldborough Music Festival. Though now based at Snape Maltings, Albra is still a magnet for all interested in music and the arts. The seaside towns are changing too. Felixstowe has grown to accommodate vast leviathans from all over the world. Whilst at Orford, the change has reversed her fortunes. This once busy medieval port is now a quiet backwater, ideal for leisure sailors and sport fishermen, and for those keen to visit Halvergate Island Bird Sanctuary aboard the Lady Florence, a sturdy ex-admiralty vessel.
The Suffolk scene changes too with the passing seasons. The calm mystery of coastal Suffolk is best experienced in the autumn and winter, but throughout the year there's always something new to see. The first students arrived at Cambridge in the 13th century. They were fleeing huge riots at Oxford. The University of Cambridge soon acquired an excellent reputation. Wordsworth, Milton, Byron and Isaac Newton all studied here. Now there are 31 colleges spread throughout the city. Most are built around a courtyard. This impeccable lawn is in front of the Senate House, where degrees are conferred. The late Gothic King's College Chapel is a highlight not to be missed. In fact, walking around the university is like visiting an open-air museum of English architecture, as the colleges were built over the course of 700 years. There were frequent clashes between town and gown until the 19th century. I doubt that anyone is complaining now. The town certainly profits from the university's tourist appeal. Bicycling is popular with townsfolk as well as university students and faculty. I arrived at the University of Cambridge through the back garden. This is definitely the loveliest approach. The lawns and meadows lying between some of the older colleges and the River Cam are humbly referred to as the backs. Punting on the river is popular with students. This tricky sport involves steering a boat with a pole, sort of like a Venetian gondola. Kayaks are a safer option, but I tried my hand at the traditional punt. While passing under the Bridge of Sighs, I read that window bars on the bridge once prevented carousing undergraduates from returning to the college in the middle of the night. Arbury Lodge Guesthouse is in Cambridge. The Milton Guesthouse is in Cambridge. The Acorn Guest House is in Cambridge. The Balkan Gate is a relic of the Roman walls that once enclosed Colchester. Ely's Cathedral is a beacon from 20 miles away. This town is named for the abundant eels that lived in the surrounding marsh. Ely isn't just another sleepy English town. It has witnessed key historical events. During the Norman Conquest, it was a center of Anglo-Saxon resistance. Oliver Cromwell, the Republican leader of the Civil War, lived in Ely. His restored home is a good illustration of 17th century life. Ely Cathedral is a blend of Norman and Renaissance Gothic architecture. Intricate ceilings survived the Reformation because they were out of reach. Wick and Fen, a 600-acre remnant of original swamp and scrub, is Britain's oldest nature reserve. It's either desolate or peaceful, depending on your frame of mind. This windmill was one of thousands used to pump water out of the marshy fens. Springfields, just outside Ely, features a beautiful flower garden there are three bedrooms. One is en suite. Flat would be a good way to describe the fens. This fertile agricultural region was once a vast, misty marsh.
In the Middle Ages, monasteries drained parts of the fens for farming. But the first large-scale project to reclaim this area from the sea was organized in the 17th century. Now, this immense agricultural area is riddled with dikes, pumps, and sluiceways. However, rising sea levels, triggered by the greenhouse effect, could eventually overcome these elaborate structures. Oakwood House Hotel is an 18th century home just outside King's Lynn. Most of the bedrooms are en suite. Fairlight Lodge is a comfortable Victorian B&B near the center of King's Lynn. Some of the rooms are en suite. The Beaches Guest House is a Victorian home in King's Lynn. Full English breakfast and three-course dinners are available. Roadside mirrors permit drivers to see around sharp turns in the road. Wells Next to the Sea is actually about a mile from the sea. This fishing village is a popular holiday resort. I hopped aboard the Wells to Walsingham Light Railway and instantly felt like a five-year-old kid with a toy train. Now this is what you call narrow gauge track. The steam engine that normally pulls the train was in the shop for repairs. The well house is a 16th century manor house near the salt marshes. It's a good base for bird watching and sailing. All the bedrooms are en suite. The cobbler's is a quiet guest house in wells next to the sea. Full English breakfast and three course dinners are available. All of the bedrooms are equipped with wash basins. In Norfolk, I found that many houses are decorated with flintstone and brick facades. Flintstones can be gathered from the seashore or quarried. Usually whole stones are used. But sometimes, the stone's glassy interiors are exposed. This unique architectural style turned up everywhere, from barns to fences. Even modern townhouses have flint exteriors. I was rushing to Cromer, but I knew better than to argue with the locals. Morden House is a late Victorian home in a quiet section of Cromer. Delicious home-cooked meals are prepared with local produce. Some of the bedrooms are en suite. The bathhouse is an elegant Regency hotel on the promenade in Cromer. Minutes from the pier and the beach. Most of the bedrooms are en suite. Blickling Hall is a classic example of Jacobean architecture. Anne Boleyn's family once lived here. As did Sir John Fastolf the model for Shakespeare's Falstaff. The formal gardens were remodeled in the late 19th century. In the woods, look for a temple, an orangery, and a pyramid. After rushing around the tourist sites, my boyfriend and I took a much needed rest on the grounds of Norwich Cathedral. Buttons Green is a 15th century farmhouse near Lavenham. The comfortable bedrooms are equipped with wash basins. Kids love the duck pond. My focus in central England was architecture. I discovered that the University of Oxford colleges were built over a period of 600 years, making Oxford an exhibition of English design throughout the ages. I was impressed by Warwick, the classic medieval castle, and Blenheim Palace has a commanding presence. But above all, I was captivated by rustic stone farmhouses in the Cotswolds. So are millions of other visitors. Tourism is the mainstay of the Cotswold economy.
Many people agree that the Cotswold area is the most delightful part of England. Its beauty and charm is legendary as it nestles so gracefully between the valleys of Oxfordshire and the Severn. The name, known worldwide, conjures up images of gentle, smooth contoured hills, of great fields divided by dry stone walls, and quiet scenes of towns and villages built of a rich, welcoming, honey-coloured limestone. The name Cotswold is derived from the Anglo-Saxon words coat, a sheepfold, and wold, meaning elevated wooded land. In every town and village, it is easy to see that sheep have played an important role in the economy and prosperity of the region. Churches especially reflect the wealth of those times with their grand and sometimes exotic decoration. The highest point, Cleve Hill, only just tops 300 metres, but the many hidden valleys and streams within this landscape offer visitors places of such peacefulness and tranquillity that it can capture the heart forever. The university colleges are scattered about the town of Oxford. Ancient Merton College was T.S. Eliot's alma mater. J.R.R. Tolkien, author of The Hobbit, also read here. Each college is built around at least one courtyard or quad. The lawns look as carefully cared for as putting greens. By the way, these guys with the bowler hats are called bulldogs. They are very helpful in giving directions. I visited the gardens around Christ Church College. Then I made brief stops at the Radcliffe Camera, a part of the Bodleian Library, 
and at Oxford's version of the Bridge of Sighs. From Carfax Tower, I had a good look at this sweet city of dreaming spires. The University of Oxford was founded in the 13th century by a few thousand boisterous students. By royal decree, they had been obliged to abandon their studies on the continent. Oxford town folk resented this invasion, and there were frequent brawls between town and gown. The Botanic Garden is across from Magdalen College. Mm, it seems it was too cold for punting. Norham Guesthouse is a charming Victorian home near Oxford Centre. There are eight bedrooms, including two family rooms. Vegetarian diets can be accommodated. Highfield House is in a quiet neighborhood minutes away from downtown Oxford. All of the rooms have color TV. Most people just drive by this ancient horse carving on the hillside. I walked up to it. The Wild Duck Inn is an exclusive country retreat near Sirencester. Come here to be pampered. A bistro-style restaurant is open to both residents and non-residents, and the innovative menu draws from French, Greek, and Japanese cuisine. Innumerable British and foreign beers are available at the bar. Book the four-poster bed early. It's very popular. Ivy House really lives up to its name. The proprietors of this Sirencester bed and breakfast have been in the accommodation business for years. Breakfast is served in a fresh, bright dining room. The wool market town of Sirencester was built at a major Roman junction. Windrush Farm Bed and Breakfast is on 150 acres of active farmland. There are bordered gardens in front and in back. Both bedrooms have ensuite facilities. Upper Farm Guest House is in a secluded location near Borton on the water. There is a breathtaking view of the surrounding Cotswolds and a friendly dog named Tanya. The bedrooms are individually furnished with floral prints and fine antiques. Our kids are still talking about this model village at Borton on the water. The name may not be appealing, but Lower Slaughter is a darling village. It's hard to determine the boundaries of the Cotswolds or Sheep's Hills. Certainly, rolling countryside dotted with stone farmhouses is a good indicator that you have arrived. Honey-colored limestone buildings improve with age and vines. The English have quite a talent for gardening. The Cotswolds are well suited to exploration. It can actually be a real pleasure to get lost in this charming region. Market House is a rustic home in the old wool market town of North Leach. Curl up by the fireplace after a long day of sightseeing. The 19th century Gloucester docks have a new lease on life. I recommend that you visit the Museum of Canal and River Navigation in England, located in a restored warehouse. This Grecian-style pump room dates from the Regency period, when Cheltenham was a fashionable spa town. Now most visitors come for internationally renowned music and literary festivals. Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's last wife, lived at Sudley Castle in the 16th century. We climbed the Broadway Tower for a stupendous view of the Cotswolds, and my daughter Andrea claims she saw the Welsh border from here. Apparently, some noble built this mini castle as a landmark just to be viewed from his mansion. This museum in Chipping Camden has a good collection of regional arts and crafts. Pear Tree Cottage is in a quaint village near Stratford. This Elizabethan house features exposed beams, flagstone flooring, and antique furniture. The shady garden is ideal for relaxing or planning the next leg of your journey. There are also self-catering cottages with modern kitchens. Telephones, cots, and garden furniture are available. King John, one of England's most hated monarchs, is buried in this eclectic cathedral. Stratford-upon-Avon is one of England's prime tourist destinations, but don't let that stop you. 
I bought a combination ticket to visit five Shakespeare properties, including his birthplace and Anne Hathaway's cottage. Warwick Castle is one of the finest surviving medieval fortresses in England. The gatehouses and outer walls date from the 14th century, when the fierce Beecham warlords lived here. William the Conqueror built the first walls. This mound is a relic of the Norman castle. By the early 1600s, the castle's military importance had diminished, so it was converted into a luxurious residence. Inside the castle, there is an extensive display of weapons for piercing, gutting, and generally inflicting bodily harm. And in the torture chamber, there are even more grisly instruments awaiting. I hate to think what this was used for. On a more serene note, Tussauds, of wax figure fame, has reconstructed a royal weekend party that took place here in 1898. From the ramparts, there is a great view of Georgian brick and Tudor half-timbered homes. That's the Avon River. Everything looks so lush, it's almost tropical. I trekked down to the Victorian Rose Garden and met the local Horticultural Society. Romantic Kenilworth Castle was made famous by Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. You can almost see the knights and ladies on the stairs. The pump room is the focal point of this Regency Resort town. This 18th century house features flagstone floors, a pine fireplace, and bay windows. Most of the bedrooms have old brass beds. Duke's Hotel is a completely refurbished Georgian residence in Stratford. The theaters are only a five-minute walk away. It has a club atmosphere with hotel services. The elegant bedrooms have ensuite facilities. The Jefferson Gardens were laid out in the 1840s. The Lansdowne is a small Regency hotel operated by a Swiss-trained couple. It feels as comfortable as a private home, but with the luxuries of a hotel. Breakfast is served as soon as you are ready. The Old School is a down-to-earth bed and breakfast in Stratton Audley. Even children and dogs are welcome. Most people hear about it through word-of-mouth references. The lounge is extraordinarily comfortable and bright. Manor Farm Bed and Breakfast is near Bister. This farmhouse has been in the Collett family for generations. There's a lovely orchard in the back. The owners, Andrew and Jeanette, can assure a warm reception with a traditional breakfast which is remarkably light. Hillside Bed and Breakfast is in the darling village of Wooten by Woodstock. This ancient stone house is definitely off the beaten track. The owner, Ruth Hirsch, serves a hearty country breakfast whenever you are ready for it. There are two double bedrooms. The architect of Blenheim Palace thought of everything, even this bridge at the palace entrance. No expense was spared in the construction of this Baroque mansion. Blenheim Palace was built to celebrate the Duke of Marlborough's military victory over the rapacious French in 1704. It's so elaborate that some have called Blenheim a monument and not a home. Mind you, it is still inhabited by the current Duke of Marlborough. The palace is probably best known because of Winston Churchill, who was born here two months premature when his parents were visiting Blenheim. The interior is lavishly decorated with heroic images. This water garden is a fairly recent addition, but it blends in perfectly with the ornate palace.
Dunvegan is the seat of the mighty MacLeod clan on the Isle of Skye. It houses a collection of unusual heirlooms, such as the fairy flag. This ruined fortress has a stunning setting on Loch Ness. It's reputed to be a good place to see the aquatic monster. Dainty Glam's Castle is a legendary home of Macbeth and the childhood home of Britain's Queen Mother. This former residence of Scottish royalty has been transformed to a military garrison. It has a terrific location atop a volcanic crag. This commanding 12th century castle was the setting for Roman Polanski's film version of Macbeth. This 13th century castle indisputably proclaimed English authority in Wales. Prince Charles' investiture as Prince of Wales was held here in 1969. The popular song Men of Harley is about a 15th century siege at this stalwart castle. This clifftop ruin on the edge of Brecon Beacons National Park is at its best during stormy weather. Warwick Castle is one of England's finest medieval fortresses. It has a horrifying weapons collection and torture chamber. Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's last wife, lived at this medieval stronghold in the Cotswolds. This romantic castle was built on two islands in a lake. Henry VIII transformed the former rugged fortress to a residence worthy of a king. Dover Castle has always been a strategic stronghold on the English Channel. Under the castle there are military operations rooms used during World War II. King Arthur is reputed to have lived at this dramatic clifftop castle. The tortuous walk up to the castle is not for the faint of heart. This 50-acre woodland garden is on a remote Scottish island. It has a great collection of azaleas and camellias. The fascinating topiary garden at Levens Hall was designed in the 17th century. This 70-acre garden in the Conwy Valley incorporates the landscape of northern Wales. It has a great collection of azaleas and rhododendrons. An inimitable Victorian garden with Egyptian, Chinese and French influences. This small garden on the grounds of a Cotswolds Manor has a delightful collection of old roses and shrubs. This magnificent 18th century landscaped garden features a series of lakes, follies and woods. This garden was built among the ruins of a medieval priory on Tresco Island. It's renowned for subtropical plants. The grounds of Blicking Hall feature formal gardens, fountains and a temple. For rose enthusiasts only, this specialty garden features 30,000 roses in almost 2,000 varieties. The British Rose Festival is held here in July. This vast landscaped garden and research center is home to over 50,000 varieties of plants. Britain's Royal Horticultural Society trains its gardeners at this 300-acre garden. The grounds of Polesden Lacey Manor feature extensive lawns, formal walks and a walled rose garden. This delightful garden was created by Vita Sackville West and her husband on the grounds of a ruined Elizabethan mansion. Balmoral is the royal family's private holiday home. When in residence, they attend services at the Crethi Parish Church. The royal family tends to stay here over Christmas and during the month of January. You may be able to see them attending Mass at nearby St. Mary Magdalene. In mid-June, the Queen's birthday is celebrated with a short parade from Buckingham Palace to Horse Guards Parade. The Queen can be seen riding in the state coach. The Queen, accompanied by the Royal Family, speaks at the opening of Parliament each fall. It's possible to see the Royals en route along Whitehall. The Royal Family always attends this exclusive horse race in early June. Every summer, the Queen hosts a couple of garden parties at Buckingham Palace for foreign visitors. Other members of the Royal Family often attend. The Royal Family attends Mass at St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle on Easter Sunday. Also, try the Royal Windsor Horse Show in mid-May. Prince Charles plays polo in Windsor Great Park during the summer. 
The High Kirk of Edinburgh has been renovated frequently since it was built in the 15th century. It once served as a meeting place for Parliament. This magnificent redstone Cistercian Abbey suffered greatly during border skirmishes. The 19th century writer Sir Walter Scott initiated extensive restoration work on the ruins. This Norman cathedral has a lofty position above the Weir River. St. Cuthbert's bones, its prized possession, attracted a lot of pilgrims in the Middle Ages. This ruined Cistercian Abbey grew rich from the profits of sheep farming. It was once bustling with hundreds of monks and lay brothers. York Minster, the largest Gothic church in England, is renowned for its splendid stained glass windows. This ancient church is often called the Ship of the Fens because it can be seen for miles away across the flat Fenland. St. Paul's was Christopher Wren's crowning achievement. Prince Charles and Lady Diana were married here in 1981. This church on Trafalgar Square is renowned for assisting London's down and out. Canterbury is the ecclesiastical capital of England. The pilgrims in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales were headed here. This church has a central position in British history. All British monarchs have been coronated here since 1066, and many well-known figures, including Shakespeare and Chaucer, are entombed here. This 13th century cathedral is a masterful example of early Gothic architecture. A copy of the Magna Carta is kept here. The west front of this cathedral is richly decorated with 13th century sculpture. Inside, look for the medieval astronomical clock. This ruined medieval abbey in the Wye Valley is the subject of one of Wordsworth's best loved poems. Robbie Burns, the flamboyant Scottish poet, was born here in 1759. William Wordsworth adored his home in the Lake District. So did his friends and fellow writers who were frequent guests at the cottage. The Bronte sisters, Charlotte, Emily and Anne, lived out their short lives here. Their father was the village reverend. This town is a must for Shakespeare enthusiasts. Highlights include the Bard's birthplace, his retirement home, and the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. The brilliant but tormented poet Dylan Thomas wrote some of his best poetry in a boat shed in this small Welsh village. The 40-odd second-hand bookshops along this central London street stock millions of obscure and classic titles. Charles Dickens was a regular patron at the Lamb, a cozy pub in Bloomsbury. The pilgrims in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales were headed to Canterbury Cathedral to pay their respects at Thomas of Becket's shrine. T.S. Eliot's play, Murder in the Cathedral, is about Becket's death. The novelist Henry James was partial to this town. He advised visitors to give in to little, restful, red-roofed, uncomplicated rye. Knoll was the setting for Orlando, the novel Virginia Woolf wrote for her friend Vita Sackville West. Rudyard Kipling wrote Puck of Pook's Hill at this restored Jacobean farmhouse. Thomas Hardy was born in a quaint, thatched cottage in Dorset. Most of his novels are set in the surrounding area. The Hound of the Baskervilles, a Sherlock Holmes adventure, is set on Dartmoor. Also, Agatha Christie wrote her first mystery at Hater. Virginia Woolf wrote To the Lighthouse in the Cornish town St. Ives. This funky pub is in a gracious Robert Adam townhouse. The associated restaurant doubles as a gallery for Glaswegian artists. This rustic inn has an awe-inspiring setting in the Langdale Valley. It's popular with rock climbers. This delightful pub is in the heart of Harriet country. It features a beam ceiling and a coal fire. The Grapes is an old coaching inn near the Cheshire Plains. There is a stable for guests who arrive on horseback. This pub claims to be the oldest in England. Soldiers heading on a crusade are said to have assembled here in 1189. 
This 17th century pub is decorated with antique brassware, armor, and an old water clock. Charles Dickens drank here, and he really knew his beer. This ancient thatched inn is on the Great Ouse River. It features a beam ceiling, rush seats, and a 900-year-old headstone. This 16th century beamed inn is in the Thames Valley. There are roaring fires in the winter and a large beer garden in the summer. This Art Nouveau pub in London is decorated with extravagant mirrors and friezes depicting the Dominican's decadent lifestyle. This authentic 18th century pub is near Bath. Darts, cribbage and homemade food are available. The fountain is just a stone's throw from Mevagissi's historic harbor. Be sure to visit on a weekend when there is a piano sing-along. This typical Cornish pub was originally the counting house for a tin mine. It's on a lonely moor with ocean views. Queen Victoria and her family spent many happy summers at this relatively new castle. It's open to the public when the current royal family is not in residence. The Earl and Countess of Mansfield welcome visitors to their grand home. It's richly furnished with rare porcelain and needlework. This palace is the Queen's official residence in Scotland. It's decorated in true restoration style. This elegant 18th century mansion in northern England was designed by Sir John Vanbrugh. It was the setting for Brideshead Revisited. This Baroque mansion was Winston Churchill's birthplace. It is lavishly decorated with fine furniture, sculpture and paintings of British heroes. This Elizabethan mansion with a lakeside setting was inspired by the Italian Renaissance. Its magnificent garden was designed by Capability Brown. Queen Victoria grew up at this palace in Kensington Garden. Some members of the royal family live here now. Inigo Jones, a well-traveled 17th century architect, modeled Wilton House on Italian Renaissance design. It has a magnificent collection of Dutch and Italian paintings. Knoll, a Jacobean manor in Kent, was the childhood home of Vita Sackville West. Sir Winston Churchill's country retreat is just the way he left it. Several rooms, including his study and the library, are open to the public. Prinny, later George IV, created this extravagant oriental palace by the sea. The sumptuous decorations are pure fantasy. This dramatic exhibition uses mannequins and an audiovisual show to illustrate social history on the Isle of Skye. This intriguing museum of social history has a good exhibit on the life of working class Glaswegians. This award-winning museum illustrates the way of life in Northern England at the turn of the century through a recreated street and a working farm. A time car transports visitors back a thousand years to an exact reconstruction of Viking York. Be forewarned, the smells are authentic too. This restored Georgian cotton mill illustrates the history of the cotton industry in Northern Britain. There is also an exhibit of the mill workers' world. Big Pit is one of a number of defunct coal mines in the South Wales Valleys that have been converted to industrial heritage sites. Don a protective helmet as you descend into the dark tunnels to learn about the miner's life. This open-air museum demonstrates the evolution of building styles and living conditions in Wales. Many skills, such as saddle making, are demonstrated in the summer. This museum of ornamental art is at the heart of the South Kensington Museum Complex. Its vast collection ranges from medieval painting to Turkish carpets. A labyrinth of wartime government offices were set deep underground to protect them from bomb raids. The public is invited to explore these well-restored offices, including the room where Prime Minister Churchill made many of his famous broadcasts. Sigmund Freud spent his last year in this Hampstead house with his daughter Anna. There are lectures and exhibits on the development of psychoanalysis. 
The luxurious Roman palace that once stood here burned to the ground in the 4th century. But the magnificent mosaic floor survived. Exhibits illustrate the lifestyle of the Roman elite. This museum of local history is in a 16th century manner granted to Anne of Cleves upon her divorce from King Henry VIII. The North America to Great Britain air route is one of the most popular in the industry. Many airline and fare options are available. Use your travel agent to help you find the best package for your needs. There are direct flights to Great Britain from the main hub cities of North America. New York, Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Direct flights are not always the best value. If you'd like to fit a bit of extra sightseeing into your trip to Britain, you might consider a fly-and-drive package via Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. With these packages, discounted car rental is bundled with your air ticket. A free week of car rental is usually part of the deal. You can fly to Amsterdam, then on to London where you can pick up your car. Or, you can take the car in Amsterdam, stay the night, and continue to Great Britain by land. You'll get to see a bit of the Netherlands, Belgium, and France on your way to your British holiday. Your travel agent stays current on these different packages and can help you to make a decision. Competition among the airlines is fierce, and ticket prices can vary dramatically from one month to the next. Getting the best price is a matter of shopping around. A travel agent can keep you up to date on changing rates. Since budget is usually a concern, most holiday travelers are looking for ways to economize on their airfare. Booking your ticket as far in advance as possible will generally reduce the price of your ticket. Flights booked on weekdays, as opposed to weekends, usually represent a saving as well. Prices also vary according to the season. Often the best value to Great Britain is early spring and late fall. There are also numerous discount fare options and packages available. If you'd like to break up your intercontinental journey to Great Britain, you can do it with a short stopover in Amsterdam, one of the gateway cities to Europe. There are several packages available, offering free or reduced rate overnight hotel accommodation in Amsterdam. You'll get a taste of the Netherlands and you can take advantage of the efficiency and fine services of Schiphol Airport. From Amsterdam, you can hop a flight to Britain, take advantage of a fly and drive package either in London or directly from Amsterdam, or take one of the efficient European trains. If you're planning to visit other European destinations before or after your holiday in Great Britain, you can take advantage of reduced European airfares. There are packages available offering discounted European fares when you purchase them along with your round-trip intercontinental ticket. You are normally allowed two pieces of checked luggage weighing 70 pounds. You may also bring one piece of carry-on luggage, which must fit under the seat or in the overhead container. It may be no larger than 9 inches by 16 inches by 20 inches. Remember that these limits may be different for a charter flight, so check with your travel agent before packing. Great Britain has three major international airports. If you're planning a trip to the West Country or Central England, you'll want to arrive at Heathrow International Airport. For the South of England, there's Gatwick International Airport. And if your destination is Wales, the Lake District, Yorkshire, Northern England or Scotland, there's Manchester International Airport. Both Heathrow and Gatwick are well connected with London. Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam is one of the main gateway airports to Great Britain and all of Europe. It's conveniently located for the North American traveler, providing fast and efficient access to any European destination via air, train or automobile. The newly opened Channel Tunnel offers the traveler a fast and efficient route between Great Britain and France. Whether you rent an automobile or use the train, taking the tunnel is an experience and can make your holiday more of an adventure. Why shouldn't you see Paris while you're overseas? 
U.S. and Canadian citizens require a valid passport with at least two months remaining validity to enter Great Britain. An entry visa is not required, but you may be asked to show proof of a booked return fare and adequate funds for your stay in the country. If you plan to include a trip to any of the neighboring countries such as France, the Netherlands or Belgium, you won't need an entry visa for these destinations either. Once again, a valid passport and return fare are the only requirements. Travelers' checks are by far the easiest and safest way to carry money on your trip. They are recognized at banks across Great Britain as well as in many stores, hotels and restaurants. Travelers' checks may be purchased at most banks across North America and in many banks in Great Britain. Make sure to purchase the checks in pounds sterling, not dollars. A sound piece of advice is to always keep your traveler's check receipts in a separate place in case the checks are stolen. This record of your check numbers will speed up a refund. Leaving an extra list of your receipts at home with a friend is a good added precaution. It's also a good idea to make a note of offices abroad where you will be able to obtain a refund if your checks are lost or stolen. Make sure you bring some cash as well as your traveler's checks. The lineups at airport exchange offices are sometimes horrendous. 100 pounds would generally be an adequate amount. Many hotels will not accept dollars. Always keep some of your traveler's checks in small denominations so you can cash them easily. Great Britain's voltage standard is 240 volts AC, 50 hertz. North American appliances require a 120 volt to 240 volt adapter which can be purchased at most travel accessory stores. At the same time you'll need a variety of receptacle adapters as there are at least three different plugs in use. Health insurance is a must while you are out of the country. Although you are not likely to encounter health problems in Great Britain, tap water is safe to drink and health services are good. Before purchasing specific travel insurance covering theft, it's worth checking the home policy that you already have. You may already be covered for theft of personal items you have with you while away from home. Trip cancellation insurance as well as health and theft insurance are available from your travel agent. When it comes to packing clothing and accessories, experienced travelers invariably advise to pack light for greater mobility and flexibility, and to select clothes that are easy to wash and dry. A 35mm camera is an excellent choice for high quality photographs. For best results, use a single lens reflex camera with changeable lenses or a zoom lens with wide range. Use a skylight filter to protect your lens. A wide angle lens is very useful for interiors and a telephoto or zoom lens is a good choice for nature shots and candid portraits. Disposable panorama and underwater cameras are loads of fun. Don't forget, if you are buying a new camera, test it at home, not abroad. VHS and 8mm videotape is readily available in Europe. If you have a Betamax camera, consider bringing your videotapes with you. Most camera battery chargers work in Europe without an electric adapter. Check your charger to confirm this. You'll need to have a plug adapter in order to plug it into the wall circuits. Bring as much film with you as possible. It's usually much more expensive to buy it in Europe. For air travel, you can best protect your film from radiation exposure by packing it in your carry-on luggage. You can ask the airport security to examine your film by hand. Choose the best film speed for your needs. ASA 64 captures intense colors, but always requires a flash indoors. ASA 400 is a good all-purpose film, but is a bit grainier than 64. ASA 1000 can be used indoors without a flash. This can be useful as most museums will allow photography as long as no flash is used. While you are abroad, store your film in a cool, dry place, not the glove compartment of your car. Britain's currency is based on the decimal system. 
with the pound sterling as the main unit of exchange. There are 100 pennies, or pence, to the pound. Bills are issued in 50, 20, 10, and 5 pound denominations. Scotland has its own notes, which although legal tender throughout the UK, are not always accepted by shopkeepers. Coins come in denominations of one pound and 50, 20, 10, 5, 2, and 1 pence. Coins will often vary in look due to different mintings. Value added tax, or VAT, is the 17.5% tax charged on most goods and services in Great Britain. Visitors to the country can claim a tax refund on goods for export via the Retail Export Scheme. Tax on services cannot be refunded. Refund on goods can be claimed at some, though not all, stores at the time of purchase or through companies specializing in VAT refunding. Contact the British Tourism Authority for further details. If you're including the continent in your travels, you may want to consider using the train for part of the journey. It's an economical, fast and relaxing way to cover long distances. There are numerous passes available offering unlimited rail travel for the validity of the pass. Some airlines will offer you discount on rail passes when purchased with your intercontinental air ticket. You don't have to visit the continent to use the train as your primary mode of transportation while in Great Britain. Train tracks crisscross the country and serve just about any destination including small villages. Train service is frequent, so you may wish to do a part of your traveling this way. Taking a taxi is a convenient and pleasant way to get around big cities, particularly London. Traffic is increasingly congested there, and a London cabbie can maneuver his way through it like magic. A two-mile taxi ride will cost you about four pounds. London's well-known black cabs now come in a variety of colors, but they are still known as black cabs. Drivers have to take stringent tests on navigating London streets before they can be licensed. Unlike in other cities, London cab drivers are among the safest drivers in the city. The best way to get out and see Great Britain is in a rental automobile. You can stop when and where you want, carry as much luggage with you as you wish, and explore areas you couldn't get to via train or bus. It's also quite economical, especially if you are a group or a family. Car rental rates in Britain and the rest of Europe are generally higher than in North America. For the lowest rates, always book in advance. Fly and drive deals are a real way to save. With these packages, airlines offer discounted car rental or a free week of rental with the purchase of your round-trip overseas airline ticket. All the major car rental companies can be found at Britain's international airports. Always ask the car rental company if the collision damage waiver and value added tax are included in their advertised rates. These additional costs can affect the final bill considerably. The majority of European rental cars have manual transmission. If you prefer an automatic, you must specify this to your rental company when making your reservation. A visitor from North America can use his or her own driver's license in Great Britain. You may also use an international driving permit, available from Automobile Association offices. For many visitors to Great Britain, driving on the left-hand side of the road is an unnerving prospect. It's actually quite easy to master. Keep in mind the following rules of thumb and you should have little trouble adapting. Since British cars have the steering wheel on the right rather than the left, always keep the middle of the road on your right hand side. Look to the right first rather than the left when entering a roadway. Always overtake on the right hand side. Roundabouts or traffic circles pose the greatest challenge to visiting motorists. These seemingly chaotic intersections are actually very well organized for traffic movement 
and are easily mastered. Traffic always flows clockwise around the circle. You are not required to stop before entering a roundabout, but you must yield to cars coming from your right side. A sign showing the exits off the traffic circle is always clearly visible as you approach a roundabout. Great Britain's road system classifies four types of road. Motorways, the equivalent of North American four-lane highways. The A roads, or smaller highways, and B and C roads, which are secondary roads. Unless posted otherwise, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour in populated areas, 60 miles per hour on two-lane highways, and 70 miles per hour on motorways. Wearing seat belts is mandatory. Pedestrian crossings are marked with striped lines across the road. Drivers must stop and yield if a pedestrian has stepped onto the striped zone. The British Travel Centre in London houses under one roof the British Tourist Authority, British Rail and American Express. It's Britain's central travel information centre. Besides providing travel information on all of the United Kingdom, the centre also books air, bus and train travel, as well as car rental. Reservations for theatres, tours and accommodations can be made, as well as currency exchange. As well as the central office, there is a network of local tourist information centres scattered across Great Britain providing services and detailed information. For more in-depth information on Wales, Scotland and Ireland, you can contact their respective regional tourist bureaus or their offices in London. Lodging in Britain ranges from the luxury hotels of London to country guest houses steeped in history. For a real taste of British life, you'll want to try the many bed and breakfast homes scattered across the country. In Britain, B&Bs are as traditional as tea and buttered scones. When budget is a concern, or you simply want a cozy atmosphere, B&B establishments are a great choice. They offer reasonable rates, friendly service and unique surroundings. You can expect a pleasant, comfortable room in a typical English home. Bathrooms are usually shared. An English breakfast is generally the only meal served. Rates are budget-oriented. Prices will be slightly higher at some of the more exclusive B&Bs, as well as those in the London area. It isn't necessary to make reservations, but during the peak season it's a good idea to book several days in advance. Most B&Bs will require a personal check or money order in order to hold a reservation. Credit cards are generally not accepted. You must use pound sterling for your transactions. Dollars are not normally accepted. You can contact B&Bs directly or use the booking services of local tourist information centers. The tourist information centers can also help you to find housekeeping cottages for two weeks to two months. These are a real bargain and can be wonderful as a base for touring the country. If you're planning a trip to the continent as part of your holiday, there are many well-organized European networks of B&B &B accommodation. Try Bed and Breakfast Holland, based in Amsterdam, and the Gite de France in Paris. For an adventure, fly to Amsterdam where you can rent a car or take the train to Britain. You can stay in one of the many delightful small hotels in Amsterdam and even tour the Netherlands and Belgium for a day or two. When you are ready for Britain, you can take a ferry or try the famous Channel. One of the largest international boat shows in Europe, held the first two weeks in January at the Earl's Court Exhibition Centre on Warwick Road in London. Two weeks of festivities based on Viking tradition celebrate the coming spring. There are fireworks, a regatta of Viking longboats, and a traditional boat burning ceremony, held in York, North Yorkshire. The Dog Show of Dog Shows. You can take in over 8,000 dogs showing themselves off in true English style. It's held at Earl's Court Exhibition Centre in London 
on the first weekend in February. The annual season of Shakespeare productions at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre runs from March to December. There is also a wide-ranging selection of plays at the Swan Theatre and the Other Place, all located in Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire. Tickets may be obtained at the box office. This is an annual festival of drama, music and the arts, with plays performed in repertory, plus concerts, exhibitions and fringe events. It's held in Pitlochry Tayside in Scotland from April to October. The world famous horse race meeting, culminating in the Grand National Steeplechase itself. It's held in Aintree Racecourse outside Liverpool, Merseyside. This is the world's biggest marathon race. It starts in Blackheath and finishes at the Mall in London. This show is the best of British gardening. It's held at the Royal Hospital on Royal Hospital Road in London. This prestigious international arts festival includes jazz and opera performances, concerts, talks and exhibitions. As many as 1,000 performers appear in the city of Bath in Avon. The festival runs from mid-May to late June. This is an international festival of first-class opera productions which has been running since 1934. It's held in Glyndebourne Lewes in East Sussex from May to August. The crown jewel of London's ceremonial year. On June 13th every year, the Queen's troops march up the Mall to Buckingham Palace. Horse guards, household cavalry, foot soldiers and marching bands combine to make this a quintessentially British event. You can watch from Streetside or get a ticket for the parade ground seats. Tickets are free and allocated by ballot. Apply in writing between January and the end of February and enclose an international reply coupon. Send it to the Ticket Office. HQ Household Division, Chelsea Barracks, London, SW1H8RF. This is a major horse race meeting attended by members of the royal family and renowned as much for its grand show of fashion as for its high racing standards. Held at Ascot Racecourse in Ascot, Berkshire. The last week in June and the first week in July. These world famous tennis championships are for both men and women. Advance booking is required for the center and number one courts. Write in October for an application form so you can be included in the ticket ballot for the following year. Outside court tickets are available daily at the gate. Be prepared to queue. Held at the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club in Wimbledon, London. This is a major exhibition of contemporary art at the Royal Academy of Arts in Piccadilly, London. It's open from June to August. These are the world famous horse racing events, first held in 1780. All take place at Epsom Racecourse in Epsom, Surrey. This international rowing event is one of the biggest social events of the year held at Henley-on-Thames in Oxfordshire in early July. This celebrated concert series, popularly known as The Proms, was founded in 1895. It's held at the Royal Albert Hall in Kensington Gore, London. The series runs from July through September. Over 30 nationalities will be competing at this annual music and dance event in Eisteddfod Field, Llangofflen in Wales. Britain's round of the Formula One World Championship is held at Silverstone Circuit in Towster, Northamptonshire. This spectacular nighttime display of Scottish military pageantry is held in the floodlit ramparts of Edinburgh Castle in Edinburgh, Scotland. The world's largest and most famous arts festival is held yearly in Edinburgh, Scotland. An annual festival of the arts in Salisbury, Wiltshire. On the first Monday in September, 
The Queen rides from Buckingham Palace to Westminster in a royal coach, accompanied by her household cavalry and the yeomen of the guard. She officially opens the oldest parliament in the world in the House of Lords. The public galleries are open on a first-come, first-served basis. Over 300 veteran car owners from around the world take part in this 57-mile annual run from Hyde Park in London to Brighton in East Sussex. This annual parade marks the inauguration of the new Lord Mayor of London. It goes from Guildhall in the city to the Royal Courts of Justice, then back again along the embankment. The procession starts at 11 a.m. The previous day, you can take part in the silent change ceremony, an almost wordless exchange of the symbols of office to the new mayor, held in the city in London. This is a wreath-laying ceremony by Her Majesty the Queen, members of the royal family and government and service organizations, to commemorate the dead of both world wars, held at the Cenotaph in Whitehall, London. In early November, large organized bonfires are lit throughout London to commemorate the Gunpowder Plot, an attempt to blow up Parliament. Guy Fawkes, the plot's famous conspirator, is burned in effigy. <laughs> oh, it's Max. He's probably going to be late again. Max? You haven't left yet! <laughs> Harrison, isn't that one of your clients? Pa! Our new caller identification service lets you see who's calling before you answer. Now, if it's for someone else, you don't have to drop what you're doing. Who is George Armani? Oh, that's for me. Ooh, should I save my place for dinner? KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines, offers reliable service from 17 cities in North America to over 150 destinations around the world. KLM, the reliable airline.